It's hard to overstate the significance of the emperor for Japan as a country. The emperor has existed for as long as Japan has existed. He is the head of Shinto, the native religion of Japan, which proclaims the emperor to be descended from gods. The degree of actual power the emperor wielded varied over the course of his existence until in 1945 when Japan lost a war against a foreign power for the first time since half a millennium and was occupied by a foreign power for the first time in its existence. Since then, the emperor has become a symbolic figure, restricted by the constitution to a degree that he does not even possess freedom of speech. In this video, we're going to take a look at the history of the imperial system and how the emperor still tries to influence Japanese politics today. To understand the significance and current state of the imperial system and the emperor, it is inevitable to understand the profound history of both. The Imperial House of Japan, or Yamato dynasty, is by far the oldest continued hereditary monarchy in the world. According to mythological accounts, the first emperor was Emperor Jimu, who founded what would later be referred to as the Land of the Rising Sun, in 660 BC. Jimu and the next 20 emperors in the traditional order of succession are seen as legendary, or at least partly legendary, with the first historically verifiable emperor ascending to the throne in 539 AD. Over the next thousand years, the emperor has only nominal powers, while military rulers known as shogun held de facto power over the Japanese archipelago. This ended in 1867, when the 122nd Emperor, Meiji, ascended the throne upon the death of his father, Emperor Komei. Prior, in 1853, Japan was forcibly opened from isolation after 250 years when an American, Commodore Matthew Perry, arrived with modern gunboats to establish a trade agreement. The sudden influx of Western technology and latest ideas of administration and government caused unrest among the ruling class samurai, who suddenly found themselves to be obsolete in this new and modern system. In 1868, daimyos of the Satsuma and Choshu clans rebelled against the Tokugawa shogunate and took control of the imperial court in Kyoto, where they influenced the young Emperor Meiji to proclaim the end of the shogunate and feudal system by consolidating domains and military forces under a centralized system led by the Emperor. The Bushin War was fought between the imperial forces and the shogunate's forces, and ended after just one year, in 1869, and while remnants of shogunate forces offered up occasional resistance, the country was firmly under the rule of the imperial faction. At this point, however, the so-called Meiji oligarchy, which consisted of former daimyos of the imperial faction, mainly from Satsuma and Choshu, was effectively ruling over Japan. Enabled by the Charter Oath of 1868, which served as a legal basis for the following years of modernization, the emperor again reigned rather than ruled. After two decades of modernization and gaining knowledge about technology and government, the oligarchy drafted the first formal constitution of the Empire of Japan, or Dainippon Teikoku, known as the Meiji Constitution, which was proclaimed in 1889. As the name suggests, the constitution revolved around the emperor and gave him wide-ranging executive powers. He was named the Supreme Commander of Armed Forces, could appoint judges to the new judicial system, as well as ministers and members of the House of Peers, the upper house of the new bicameral system, which consisted mainly of members of nobility like the House of Lords in the UK. He was also given the right to dissolve the House of Representatives, the lower house, and was counseled by the Privy Council, which consisted mainly of members of the oligarchy. It is heavily debated among historians exactly how much power Emperor Meiji truly wielded at this time. 
Some say he was a passive leader, even a puppet used by the oligarchs to control the country. Others say he actively opposed liberalization and democracy and was an autocratic leader. The lack of evidence caused by the notorious seclusion of the emperor means we will probably never conclusively get an answer to this question. Emperor Meiji, who was plagued by genetic disorders for his entire life, finally succumbed to his illnesses in 1912, leaving the throne to his son, who would later be referred to as Emperor Taisho. When the new emperor was crowned in 1912, Japan had become a fully modernized colonial power with a modern military and navy. Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula were colonized during Meiji's reign, and in 1904, Japan gained a seat at the table of world powers when they won the Russo-Japanese War by conquering Port Arthur in China, as well as all but destroying the Baltic fleet of the Russian Empire at the Battle of Tsushima. Emperor Taisho was suffering from genetic disabilities and illnesses even worse than his father, which led to him being shielded from the public even more strictly. The waning influence of the unpresentable Emperor Taisho extended to the oligarchy and privy council. This was further accompanied by an unwanted byproduct of modernization. Ideas like anarchism and communism, as well as support for universal suffrage and a modern quote-unquote degenerate lifestyle, began to spread among the growing middle class of salarymen and working women. Taisho democracy refers to the liberalization of Japanese politics and society during this era. After mass riots against government-mandated price regulation of rice, a moderate candidate was appointed to become prime minister. Hara Takashi, referred to as the commoner prime minister, took a moderate stance on colonialism, enacted universal manhood suffrage, and led his country to join the League of Nations after World War I. Emperor Taisho's worsening mental health soon made it completely impossible for him to fulfill his imperial obligations, which is why in 1921 his son, Hirohito, was appointed his regent. In the 1920s, the Japanese government took a general policy of maintaining good relations with other great powers. They signed the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited the number of warships, and acknowledged the status quo of island territories in the Pacific. Domestic policy was shaped by politically motivated assassinations, which were already happening since Meiji, but in the 1920s, anarchist or communist sympathizers, as well as independence activists from occupied colonies, began to target the imperial family. Emperor Taisho finally passed away in 1926, and the imperial crown passed to his son and regent Hirohito, who would later be referred to as Emperor Showa. After ascending to the throne, Emperor Showa was presented with a politically unstable Japanese government. Over the years, anarchists and communists gained support, liberals and reformists were split on key issues regarding the imperial system or colonization, and most importantly, the military and navy began to split into different factions, ranging from moderates to ultra-nationalists. The militarist faction wanted to establish a system of ultra-nationalism and totalitarianism, with the emperor as the supreme authority, a strong military, and an expansion of colonialism, as well as war with the US and Britain. In the 1930s, almost every single prime minister was either assassinated or escaped an assassination attempt by military officers. De facto prime ministers have long lost control over the military, with generals and officers taking their own decisions without consulting the cabinet or diet first. Emperor Showa's position is difficult to point out because, although militarist factions were staging coups against the government, this did not include the emperor himself or the imperial system. As supreme commander, Emperor Showa urged swift measures to suppress rebellions by army officers, like the February 26th incident in 1936. After the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937, the militarist faction was almost completely in control of the government until 1945. Now, the role of Emperor Showa during World War II and his involvement in war crimes 
is a controversial matter that is debated to this day both overseas as well as in Japan. Defenders of the emperor view him a constitutional monarch who did not get involved in politics and whilst knowing of the aggressive nature of the Japanese military, lacked the power to rein it in. Others attest the emperor more than just a lack of political power, but an ideological overlapping with militarism, as well as the issuing of direct orders of allowing the use of chemical weapons. Primary sources of Emperor Showa's political or military actions are almost non-existent. Between the surrender of Japan and the first arriving occupying forces were almost two weeks during which military and government officials who were in disarray and conflict with each other prior to the surrender suddenly bound together with one goal, destroying all evidence of culpability of the emperor. In early 1945, when the war was almost certainly lost, the idea of surrendering was debated among government officials. While this matter was controversial, with some people willing to surrender colonies and territories and others wanting to fight until the end, everyone agreed on one thing. The Koktai, the existence of the emperor and the imperial system, was non-negotiable. Therefore, after the surrender proclaimed by the emperor, there was an unwritten agreement among military officers and government officials to deny any culpability or involvement of the emperor, even when they themselves were indicted. A true picture of the degree of involvement will probably never be painted. However, we can surely exclude the extremes. An involvement of the emperor as a leader in day-to-day -day planning, strategy and logistics of a war effort can be excluded based on the existing evidence. There is also evidence suggesting the emperor was not an ideological extremist, militarist or fascist. He was wary of the pro-German sentiment of some of his subordinates and was not necessarily overjoyed to sign the tripartite pact. Emperor Showa was also worried about starting a war with the US or the Soviet Union, as opposed to the most radical elements in the army who were happy to cause an all-out war for the glory of Japan. Emperor Showa is certainly not comparable to Hitler, Stalin or Mussolini, as he simply refrained from exercising too much of his power and was certainly not a public figure who gave speeches. On the other side, the image of the emperor being portrayed as completely free of culpability also most likely doesn't match reality. As it is often the case, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. In the beginning, the emperor was supporting the expansion, maybe because of a rather common sentiment of pan-Asian Japanese racial supremacy, the idea that Asia needs to be free of colonizers from Europe and America and should, under the leadership of the superior Japanese people, become a world power. Over the years, he probably became disillusioned, as many Japanese people did, with the incompetence of the army and navy and reconsidered expansionism as a dangerous way of thinking that ultimately leads to the death of a country. The surrender of Japan was initiated and proclaimed by the emperor, who made the decision after two atomic bombs were dropped and the Soviet Union invaded Manchuria. A speech proclaiming the surrender was aired on radio to the Japanese subjects, and even though elements of the army tried to stage a coup in order to fight until the end, the emperor in the end prevailed and the war was lost. In the end, the question of the emperor's involvement was never answered, also because the American occupying forces consciously acted to protect the image of the emperor and did not indict him for any war crimes in order to stabilize post-war Japan. Now that World War II was over and the emperor was to be kept in some form of official position, the question was which? The American occupying forces did not want to indict the emperor, but they were also not just going to give him de jure absolute power like the Meiji constitution did. A new constitution was drafted under the eyes of the occupying forces, which also set the legal basis for the imperial throne to this day. In this new constitution, the people, and not the emperor, are the sovereign of the state of Japan. The emperor continues to exist as the symbol of the state and the unity of the people, deriving his position from the will of the people, 
with whom resides sovereign power. The emperor was reduced from an almost absolutist sovereign to a mere symbol with the stroke of a pen. Article 3 states that the cabinet has to improve any and all acts of the emperor in matters of state. Article 4 states that the emperor does not have powers related to government. The emperor's powers became purely ceremonial this time, not only de facto, but de jure as well. The new imperial household law drastically downsized the Japanese royal family, only the closest family members of Emperor Showa. Of note is also the famous Humanity Declaration, which was included in the New Year's speech of the emperor in 1946, in which he proclaimed himself to be human and not a divine being, and that the Japanese people were not racially superior. This was a rather contentious issue, though. While the supreme commander of the occupying forces, Douglas MacArthur, insisted on erasing the divinity of the emperor, something which he viewed as enabling racial supremacism and ultranationalism, the emperor himself was said to not endorse the idea. There are certainly difficulties in interpreting the idea of divinity in Shinto, and especially the idea of the emperor being a descendant of a god from a western point of view, which is why to this day scholars and experts disagree on what the Humanity Declaration actually entails. After the new constitution was in force and Japan began to recover from the devastation of the war, the emperor's life began to change as well. While the surrender speech broadcast over radio was the first time for most Japanese people to actually hear the voice of the emperor, this state of seclusion was to end. The emperor, along with his wife, turned towards a more public life. He gave a speech in Hiroshima in 1947 to lift the spirits of the survivors. In the 1970s, he traveled to Europe and America and played a vital role in diplomatic relations at the time. He addressed survivors of Pearl Harbor, met President Ford, Queen Elizabeth, and other European leaders. Emperor Showa died on January 7, 1989, becoming the longest reigning Japanese emperor in history and one of the longest reigning monarchs in world history. He was succeeded by his son and heir, Akihito, who would later be referred to as Emperor Heisei. Emperor Heisei was, in many aspects, even more of a symbol of modernization than his father or grandfather. Born in 1933, he spent most of the war on the countryside and was finally recalled to the palace and educated in English and Western culture and values after the war. Akihito was in many ways akin to a European monarch during his time as a crown prince. While many people thought and also expected Akihito to marry a descendant of former royalty, he instead married a commoner, although from a rich family, who was a Catholic. Needless to say, this angered traditionalists in government and especially the imperial household agency. The general public, however, enjoyed the romantic image of a crown prince marrying a commoner, and the marriage was soon approved by the imperial household. Just like his father, the crown prince visited foreign countries and helped alter the image of Japan away from aggressor. When Emperor Heisei took the throne in 1989, the constitutional monarchy was in effect for about 40 years, and Japan enjoyed unprecedented economic growth. The people saw firsthand that ultranationalism, militarism, and expansionism were not necessarily an integral part of being Japanese. However, the unwillingness of the Japanese government and American occupiers after the war to thoroughly prosecute and purge former ultranationalists and instead purging communists came to change the political landscape of Japan to this day. Neither the Japanese government nor the Japanese people ever fully accepted that their colonialist and expansionist past was wrong. The Japanese government after the war and even to this day are not able and willing to fully repair the relationship to countries which were the main victims of Japanese aggression during World War II. The diplomatic relationship with South Korea and China is uneasy to this day because of a myriad of issues ranging from Japanese textbooks describing World War II apologetically 
the issue of comfort women and Japanese politicians visiting the Yasukuni shrine, which enshrines class A war criminals. So, a new emperor was crowned and he will change the political landscape surrounding the imperial court over his 30-year reign. To that end, we need to ask ourselves, what are the politics of the emperor who is supposed to tell no one about his politics? While Emperor Showa was reluctant in talking about the war and especially his involvement, Emperor Heisei was different. Only a year after his ascension, he stated during a meeting with the South Korean president that he felt the deepest remorse regarding the suffering which was brought about by our nation. There are many other instances in Asian countries, but also in the US, where the emperor expressed remorse, though he did not outright apologize. This is a tricky situation for the emperor. As an apology actually entails would certainly echo among the Japanese public and would be considered a bona fide political statement as the emperor would basically overrule the elected government and take Japan's national honor in his own hands. Even though an apology was never given, the sheer number of times the emperor expressed remorse separates him ideologically from the conservative Japanese government. It is also apparent that Emperor Heisei holds the constitution and the role of the emperor proclaimed therein to a high degree. In 2016, he talked a great deal about the imperial system and how a changing world and an aging population, as well as an aging emperor, may necessitate a change in the laws regarding the imperial system. He also referenced Article 1 of the Constitution, which says the emperor is a symbol of unity. This could be interpreted as an ideological attack against Japanese right-wing groups like Nippon Kaigi, one member is Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who want to reinstate the emperor as a quote-unquote proper monarch, or at least make him the sovereign again. It is quite ironic. The person that the Japanese right-wing wants to become ruler does not see himself as one, and instead he often refers to the current constitution, which restricts him drastically. Historical revisionism and relativism regarding World War II are common among Japan's top politicians, including most famously Japan's longest-serving prime minister Shinzo Abe. Emperor Heisei, however, it seems, does not share this spirit, and instead has taken some opportunities to take a carefully worded jab at Abe, and other revisionists, when we look at some of his remarks. In his New Year's speech of 2015, the emperor marked the 70th anniversary of World War II and urged the people to take this opportunity to study and learn from the history of this war, starting with the Manchurian incident of 1931. Except from outright stating that everyone should learn about and study World War II, it was also odd that he chose to declare the beginning of the war in 1931 with the Manchurian incident, rather than in 1937 with the Marco Polo Bridge incident. The Manchurian incident is widely believed to have been a false flag operation conducted by the Japanese army in order to unjustly invade Manchuria without having to formally declare war. This led some commentators to interpret the emperor's remarks as an effort to restrain Prime Minister Abe by clearly and unequivocally stating that the beginning of the war was the Japanese government's will. Now granted, all of those remarks by the emperor are worded rather ambiguous. However, of course the emperor cannot outright express a political opinion per the constitution which he is also bound to protect. This is the political dilemma that Emperor Heisei found himself in. He himself wants to protect the constitution from ultranationalists, but by protecting the constitution, he also cannot make statements in order to further his goal of protecting the constitution. Emperor Heisei found a solution in essentially including little dark whistles in his statements, by which he can maintain full deniability but still carry a message across to politicians and, most importantly, the people. The emperor basically has a three-way relationship with the constitution and the government. 
He wants to protect the constitution and especially the imperial system according to the constitution. The constitution, however, restricts the emperor greatly in his power. The government, at least under Shinzo Abe, wants to change the constitution in order to turn Japan into a normal country by increasing the emperor's power. The emperor, however, does not want to gain more power and thus has to do everything in his limited power to restrain the government in their efforts to give him more power. Now, while Emperor Heisei de Jure held no power at all, he was, and still is, extremely popular among the general public, which means he holds a lot of soft power, and people will hold the emperor's wishes to a high regard. Emperor Heisei's political soft power was most evident during the abdication debate in 2016 and 2017. As I said earlier, Emperor Heisei hinted at his wish to abdicate by referencing his deteriorating health in 2016. As there is no law allowing an emperor to abdicate in the imperial household law, the emperor needed to exercise his influence in order to create one. Now, as the constitution forbids the emperor on making political comments, which includes comments on laws, the emperor again has to ambiguously state his wish. In July 2016, NHK reported that the emperor wishes to abdicate. And in August of 2016, the emperor held a televised speech to the public, in which he implied his wish to abdicate. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe created a committee to debate abdication. And in 2017, he introduced a bill that allows Emperor Heisei and only Emperor Heisei to abdicate. The bill passed both houses and in Golden Week 2019, Emperor Heisei abdicated the throne, which passes to his eldest son, Naruhito, who is now referred to as Emperor Reiwa. Now, the debate regarding abdication was difficult for the Prime Minister and the government. It is said that Emperor Heisei wished to abdicate as early as 2010, but that the Imperial Household Agency did not offer to help him. After Emperor Heisei's speech in 2016, the overwhelming majority, around 80% according to surveys, of Japanese people supported the Emperor in his wish to abdicate, and around 70% wanted a permanent law which enables all coming emperors to abdicate. You may ask yourself, why the prime minister and government would not want to allow an elderly person to retire. Mind you, the emperor was already well into his 80s by this point. As I said, the abdication was not something Prime Minister Abe wanted to get himself involved with. The reason for that lies in the succession system of the imperial throne. According to the imperial household law, the succession system is male-only primogeniture, which means only men can ascend to the imperial throne. Today, the line of succession after Emperor Reiwa would be his younger brother, Crown Prince Akishino, then Akishino's son, Hisahito. The daughter of the current emperor, as well as the daughters of Crown Prince, cannot take the throne. Before Hisahito was born in 2006, it was unclear whether a male heir after Akishino could be produced, and the prime minister at the time, Juichiro Koizumi, wanted to pass a bill which would turn the male-only primogeniture into absolute primogeniture, effectively allowing women to become empress. This was controversial, and traditionalists certainly did not like the idea of further modernizing the imperial throne. Introducing a system that allows any emperor to abdicate at any time could potentially exacerbate the succession crisis to a level where the prime minister again is forced to make the unpopular decision among his traditionalist peers to let women ascend to the imperial throne. This is why Shinzo Abe at the time did not immediately jump at the chance to let the emperor abdicate. However, the overwhelming public support the emperor enjoyed forced his hand in the end. The abdication debate showed the latent power of the emperor, as he effectively managed to change imperial law according to his wishes by utilizing the support among the public which he invoked by making an address in which he circumvented the constitutional gag order on commenting on laws. Seeing this influence really makes you think. What could the emperor accomplish if he wanted to exercise more of his power 
and if he was not as liberal and as bound to the constitution as Emperor Hese. It's hard to say, as Emperor Rewa's reign is still short, but it is nevertheless going to be interesting if and how Emperor Rewa will spend his latent political power in the future. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked the video. I got more coming up in the Emperor in the future. And if you're interested in Shinzo Abe and how he became the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history, I got a video about that right here. Have a nice day.